use these kinds of techniques where you're, if you ask students that to answer a question, solve a problem. Um, how many of you do this kind of thing within the class? Okay, so a good portion. So, so what I'm hoping today is that this will give you some additional ideas and, and kind of allow you to even broaden things a little bit further in, in what you're doing. So many of the things that, that we do with active learning are, are like you ask them to sketch an outline, ask them to write down the key idea or solve part of a problem and so forth. So um, you can have the students do it actively or you can turn it into sort of a team type of activity. So you can have them uh, work in pairs or in groups of three or four to solve activities. As I'll mention later on, so I do a, uh, flipped, a lot of flipped teaching where I'll put my talk and chalk sort of things online. And then when the students come in, they actively work with problems. And so when I do things this way, uh, oh my gosh, you know, they come into class and it's like they are active, they are ready to go because they know about also, because the first half of class, I give them uh, active problems to work that will have, if they're able to do those successfully, they may do better on the quiz, which is in the last half of the hour. And so, boy, uh, the students really, really focus on these things. So I give them anywhere from 10 seconds to two minutes uh, to work on a problem and turn the loose on these things. So a key point is to call on an individual or two for that uh, before you're asking to work on uh, answers. So picking on a, a, a particular person is really helpful. What I often do, and you can do this if you have a class of like 50 to 100, but we'll often kind of know the better students. And if it's a tougher problem, I'll somebody who I know is more likely to be able to handle it so I'm not going to be able to submit money uh, if it's easier. But then sometimes if I know somebody who's not really paying attention, I'll pick on them. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a class of six or less, I usually try to uh, memorize the names of everybody. And they found that there is one common factor of students that helps people in the schools, and that is that at least one faculty member knew that student's name. So, uh, so it, it does make me laugh sometimes because we're often very keen on, uh, on teaching and that our students must learn new information, but we don't bother to actually make ourselves uh, take the time to learn some of these things. So uh, there are really good tricks to name learning. And I, I would strongly recommend that there's some good books on how you memorize names. So you, know, you meet Wanda, that's a wand going through Wanda's hair or something like that. But these kinds of mental tricks for uh, memorizing names can make it a lot faster and a lot easier. So I, I highly recommend that kind of thing if you can and your classes aren't too large. Another thing is even if your classes are huge, so you got a thousand students, memorize a couple names and call on those and they'll think you know everybody's names. <laughs> and it's so good. It's really good. It's like, how'd you do that? So um, there is the technique of think, pair, share. So you, uh, what I'll do with this is I'll ask students to work on something individually and then I'll ask them to team up and compare their answers. So that's a good technique. Um, and the, the benefits in it are that as little as five minutes of this kind of thing can actually produce quite a big boost in the What happens is, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, if we sat there and really concentrated on that giraffe that we wanted to kill, right, and we totally concentrated for half an hour, that lion would come right up behind us and kill us, right? It's, it, so we actually needed to be able to focus for a while, but also to look, go and kind of sense out the greater environment. So that, I think, explains part of why we can focus for only so long before our attention kind of falls off. Uh, and it's because 
people who could focus too, too effectively for too long a time are not here with with <laughs> So, uh, so we we are actually just um, going in line with how the brain works if we have act, uh, points where we're having them focus and then where we're having them just kind of uh, doing the more relaxed work of, of active learning. So it, it does work well to have, to kind of follow that television idea where you've got 15 minutes of on, 12 to 15 minutes of on, and then three or four minutes of off. But also, you, you don't want to make things too expected from your students. So it's a really good idea to uh, sort of mix things up uh, and, and always keep things a bit surprising. Now, um, another good thing about this approach is if you have a student who's just falling asleep, you'll, you'll see it all the time. When you're talking, they're sleeping. And when they actually have to start working at a problem, the teammates are like, come on, wake up. And now this is what was going on here. And, uh, and, it, and it works for you. So weak students are tutored by stronger students, of course. And then the stronger students get that sort of deeper learning and cultural practice. So um, of course, the thing is, just as with that one student who uh, I tried to put on notice that he wasn't learning the material, if students hear from other students that they aren't getting the material, that's what it really makes a much more powerful impact. In the end, students own the material much, much more effectively if they're actively engaged with it. So there's another technique called TAPS, Think Out Loud Pair of Problem Solving. And this one is, uh, well, although the examples I'm giving here are often seemingly oriented towards STEM topics. The reality is that a lot of these kinds of approaches and ideas are really grown from the humanities. And um, another, and that we'll speak about this this afternoon some more, but another great thing that's grown from the humanities is metaphor and analogy. And unfortunately, because of the silo of science as opposed to the humanities, we often don't bring metaphor and analogy and some of these great and brilliant approaches from the humanities and the social sciences where they need to be in uh, STEM. But hopefully, we can give back on STEM to the humanities some, some insights about what, how we've taken their ideas, reshaped them a little bit, and kind of presented them back on the platter. So, uh, maybe these group formulations also give some ideas for you. Now, um, so here's how TAPS works. Uh, you have students work in pairs through, uh, so you will already have, um, so let, let's go for a moment into constructivism. Constructivism uh, is, as probably all well know, is an approach where the student themselves must they, they, they are, you want the ideas to originate from the students. And this works really very well when you're at younger levels. But the more, the higher you go, the more difficult it is to have somebody that's got a brain like Newton to come up with calculus. Um, it, it's just, it's really time consuming and really hard. And so most, um, most instructors in math and science uh, at, uh, at college levels find that uh, it, it can be very, very helpful the first time you're looking at problems to see a worked out solution and to kind of see the approaches that have been taken and why. But if you just look at the worked out solution, that's pretty dry and it's not really actively getting in your brain. So what's the best sort of way to mix up this idea of uh, having them work it all out them, or come up with it all themselves and having them just follow a cut dry pre-presented solution. It is to give them uh, a, a problem that's already worked out that they can step through but then act, actually ask them to work through this problem themselves. So first, one will explain the problem step by step to the other. And then the other one, questions on clear statements or they give hints. And then you, you, um, yeah, you are, during this time, 
you have them periodically reverse roles, you can stop them while you're doing this process and ask them kind of what's going on, what are your, your uh, conclusions about this. And I know what some of you are thinking. I could never have time to do this and actually cover the material. Right? So we're going to talk about that. Because that's a very important, very legitimate uh, concern that actually can be very well addressed through these techniques. So, uh, in fact, a typical course has around 40 contact hours. So the thing is, I could cover 200 pages of the textbook in those 40 contact hours. I mean, I could just be like, I out there, you're going to get this, this is this. And me talking does not put it in their brain. So no matter how fast I go, how much material I cover, I'm not being a good teacher if, if it's not actually going into their brain. So you have to ask yourself, what is your objective? And the, the, the reality is that people only acquire knowledge when they actively work with the material themselves. And, and it's not by watching somebody else that you kind of get started. It's like somebody on training wheels with a bicycle, right? You, you can get them started by guiding them and holding them and so forth. But, but they acquire knowledge and develop skills only through repeated practice themselves and through feedback themselves. So uh, another thing that is recently coming out from neuroscience is we often feel that um, students understand things and they understand it first and then they practice with it. But actually it turns out that you develop your understanding through the practice as much as just understanding it first. So that practice and doing together of materials or even just doing on their own of materials is really important uh, for students to, act, to actively understand and grasp the materials. So it, to make your lectures worthwhile, punctuate your lectures with active exercises. It energizes the students, focuses their attention on the most important points, and um, the increased learning compensates for a, a slight loss of the material that's, that's covered in class. So you can still cover all the material you would normally cover, so what you do is put material in class handouts that includes gaps, and, I, and I'll show you some of these. And in that you will not cover materials in handouts in the class, but it could show up on tests. And one thing that I do <coughs> is, for example, this is So here is uh, um, something on vector analysis, and so I've got the class notes all written out. But in between, there's like, see, here's a problem, and I'm stating the problem, and then there's a big blank in the notes where the students will work the problem out together. So you can either have these pre partly done notes in this form where they're handwritten. Or uh, another thing that you can do is, um, let's see. Is, um, if you look here, these, um, I don't have the sound for this, but this is a PowerPoint presentation. And what I've done is I've used something called a Wacom tablet. There are some special sets, the null set and the usual this. So I'm kind of talking through this now uh, and filling this out. And it is not even a And so basically you can see me filling this out. So what I do is I'll have PowerPoints, and the PowerPoints are online for the students to download. They can print them out, and they can do them with a, they can, uh, they can do these, uh, uh, so 
See, the problem is simply it's all written, and it makes it really easy for them because you don't have to rewrite the problem and then start looking at the solution and so forth. And also, I can have illustrations and so forth. So, so um, if you use these kinds of techniques where it's like you're giving them some of the information already, um, and then you're just filling out little parts of it, you can cover a lot of material. And like, like what I was doing before with the um, with that initial uh, where I was, it was like fill in the blanks of things. Those were key ideas, and I was having them write that key idea, and that helps neurally encode that key idea. And so I had a student come up to me, for example, and he says, uh, "Well, I had told him I said you're flunking the class." And he said, you know, I'm flunking the class, and the reason I'm flunking the class is because I don't understand English very well. And he spoke, and he said it just about like this. And, and I'm like, yeah. okay, uh, let me ask you this. When we active, when I ask you to actively work the materials in class, are you actively engaging in working the materials? When I ask you to watch a video and then I tell you to stop it and do it, do you actually stop and do the problem yourself? No. So the student had fooled himself about what the reason was for why he was flunking. Because when you look at the problem being solved, as we often do when we're just talking chocolate through things, you think, that's obvious, I know it, or I can get it, or I can copy it from the test or whatever. And they don't. They, they don't understand that they don't get it until they actively start trying to work it themselves. So uh, again, that's where I think a flip class is the best because you can put your best video material up online, and then when you get together, it's not wasting time when you're just talking to them. It's them actively learning the material, and then they're asking you how when they have problems. Now you might say, well, yeah, this is great for when you've got smaller classes, but what about large classes? And actually, these are most effective for large classes. Um, so the larger the class, as it turns out, the more important it is to use um, these kinds of active learning techniques. A key point is that students are more comfortable and more confident in groups of one through four. And you can break them into these kinds of groups. Now, one thing I do when I have a class of around uh, 60, you know, 30 to 60, I will often, I will divide them into groups like this. As, um, you know, if I have 40 students, say, then I'll have uh, maybe, 10, maybe 11 or 12 groups. Most of them are of four, but a few of three in case people are adding in or something like that. Then I'll, I'll start the class by saying, oh, hello. Uh, I want you to count off. So it'll be one, two, three, and they'll, they'll be actively counting off. And I'll say, I want you to count up to 12. And the person after 12 is one. Everyone remember your number. And so we count around the classroom. And so then I'll say, OK, I want all the ones to come right here. Twos go right there, threes go there, four, you know, and I tell them where to go. They all go off. They meet, they get together, they, uh, and then, um, so I do this right at the beginning of class, before they can kind of understand what's actually going on. And the purpose of this is this, you don't want any friends sit together. And so if you count off like this, you are automatically breaking out all the sit together groups. So, um, but uh, for very large classes, I, I do this, for very large classes, uh, what you want to do is use these techniques. You will have a very happy bubble of activity as people are working these. And what it does is psychologically, it's like it's kind of like a video game. You or, or, or a big where when you go into a big concert event, this happy bubble. People get more enthusiastic about what you're doing just because they hear everyone being excited. So you want to stop your activity after a uh, prescribed time. Call uh, anybody you want to. Uh, and I 
personally tend to overload on Pauline in the back of the class. This is where the clowns sit, right? So you know, I always also try to make a special point of learning the meanings of the people who sit all the way in the back. And that way, they can't escape uh, and, and kind of know what's going on. Uh, and get them more. And the, the, uh, the troublemakers are often the most creative, most interesting students. And if you can get them engaged, it actually engages much of the class. So avoid, of course, um, calling for volunteers. I use, as I mentioned, for my flipped classrooms, I often use problem-based learning. So um, here's what I do. I have, I have tests online. So I have videos online, and then a quiz online, and then they have homework to do. And so you might say, but they can cheat on their online quizzes. How do you handle that? And here's how I handle that. Uh, if whatever, so we have, so they come into class every other day, so they're only coming in half as many times. And when they do come in, they're actively working problems for the first half, for the first hour of the class. For the second hour of the class, we have a quiz. So there's a quiz every week or most weeks if I'm out of town, which they love it when I go out of town, there's no quiz. Uh, but so the first half of class is actively learning. Uh, so I give them a bunch of problems that are somewhat akin to the problems that we both have. And then I um, and then the last half I give them this quiz. And it, it works really, really well. Um, uh, but what I do to handle the cheating problem on quizzes, uh, on online quizzes, is I say if your online quizzes are, are better, if the score is better on average at the end of the course than your in-person quizzes, your in-person quiz score gets substituted for your online quiz And that solves so many problems. And what I do is, so students will say, at the end of the class, they'll think that they're going to pass the class because all these other things avoid them up, even though they're doing it really terribly in their in class problem. You know, so they don't know the material, and you know they don't know the material. So uh, to keep them from saying at the end, because it's all the syllabus, but who needs this? Even when I tell them on the first day of class, they still don't like I didn't know that. So I have a little introductory quiz that counts 5%. And I, and I put the key items of the quiz as true, false, or multiple choice questions so that whatever I wanted them to have on the syllabus to get at, they had to take the quiz out. So I know that they, they actually took, um, they understood that this was a good time. And it just works, it's more great for the uh, past couple decades. So, uh, so uh, this problem based doing a problem yet, uh, actively in class works really, really well. And um, so what I do is I, I give them uh, a <coughs> handout, open up problems and so forth to last about an hour. I often well, I'll have the problem statement and then I'll have the like for it's it's easy in a numerical class. I can put a one line the numerical answer to that. So when they're working through together, they can at least see if they've hit the target. And if they can't hit the target, then they know to raise their hand or talk to them. I like to encourage them to do um, sort of send out emissaries. So it's not only that they can work with their teams in classes, but if they're stuck, they can like, check with other teams. And it, it produces this class cohesiveness. Well, uh, another thing that I do, you know, can we lower this thing? and their hobby. 
And the, I say it has to be really fast because we're more than, but it, somehow, people start saying funny things, and especially, uh, and, and it really breaks the ice and it helps to knit together this sort of cohesive approach to uh, uh, there, there was there was one study that was done where they couldn't figure out there were all these really, really disadvantaged students. But there were a few students from this whole school system that always seemed to do really, really well. And this was a, a very bit. The study took place over many years. And they kept trying to figure out why do some students excel from this very disadvantaged big school district? And they, they studied.